I'm here to welcome you. Welcome to our first Social Innovation Forum virtual showcase. Um, it's our 17th showcase ever, but our first virtual. And as things move, we move too. And so opportunity to meet many of you online. As I say, we're expecting a group of about 400 people. I'm Susan Musinski, Executive Director of the Social Innovation Forum, and really delighted to see the audience keep filling up. And as we mentioned, so many of our friends and partners. Um, the quick agenda for what today is gonna look like, I'm gonna give you an overview talk you through some of the Zoom webinar opportunities, um, give you a little bit of information about the Social Innovation Forum, and then you will hear from four of our innovators, Elevated Thought, Whale, the 1647, and Boston Herc, and then we will at three o'clock move into a question and answer session. Um, so as we get going, the Zoom webinar, for those of you interested, there's closed caption button at the lower end of your screen. We also, many of you have found your way into the chat box and we're thrilled. Keep chatting and sharing the, you know, giving positive reinforcement to the innovators. Um, we're not going to be able to see everyone today, but the chat box is a way for you to cheer them on. Um, also, we will have a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So anytime you come up with a question and certainly in between the presentations, we'd love you to ask questions that we can then refer back to when we get to the Q&A section of the, of the agenda. Um, lastly, if you get logged out or you need any help, um, certainly these webinars are new for all of us and it's our first today. Um, email rsvp at socialinnovationforum.org org our team is standing by and will definitely help you so i have several thanks to give um, as many of you know um, rolling into a virtual event from an event where we usually have 400 per people together to a virtual event takes a lot of support and it takes partnership so we want to thank our event sponsors who stayed with us through this transition to wbur our media sponsor to marcus partners Eastern Bank, Fidelity Charitable, The Gross Family, Goulston and Stores, Rynette, Nutter, First Republic Bank, Rockland Trust, Eaton Vance, and Delta Dental. Big thank you to, to all of you for being our partners. Um, we also have partnerships with our 2020 track partners. So we began this work um, over 12 months ago with a number of different of funders and again as things shifted the funders were right there beside us and so to boston open impact to the jacket foundation to the inspire boston funder collaborative to welling Man wellington management foundation to schraff charitable trust the mass mutual foundation and edith m ashley fund at the boston foundation we say a very sincere thank you for being our partners and staying alongside us as we navigate all of this newness um, in a 17th year of our work so a little bit about the social innovation forum some of you know us really well and for others of you probably this virtual time with us in your own living room might be the first time you're you're hearing who we are and what we do and so half of our work the purple side is actually working with innovators and entrepreneurs who are nonprofit leaders and they are doing creative work in the community and have come to the social innovation forum to help be a partner and and have us alongside them as they build their capacity they're looking for ways to develop and grow and begin to get their message out to a bigger and broader audience most of these groups all of these groups are um, have budgets under $2 million, but 80% of them are very small with budgets under $1 million and staff between two and four people. And so oftentimes people in the funding community and the broader community have never heard about them. And then half of our work on the green side is actually working with investors and supporters like many of you who are in our audience today and investors and supporters not only give money but many give time and give connections and bring resources to bear but i think the important piece if you look at our model is the gear in the middle and the way that we connect people and bring them together and we have always believed in being together in the same room 
And certainly in this environment, we are in a room together in a completely different way and we're all learning. But what we're beginning to figure out is how do we do a marketplace and do it virtually and make sure that relationships and connections and information about one another begins to be surfaced. And we certainly all acknowledge that the world has changed dramatically um, since we started with these innovators just six months ago. These organizations have been doing important change work since way before COVID, um, for months and for years and for decades. And at this time, we know that the community is facing such unprecedented challenges from, from coronavirus and COVID. And we're seeing real disparities. And we know that um, a few of the key things is the unemployment rate in Massachusetts has jumped from 2.5% in February to over 15% by the end of April. And we certainly know that much is ahead of us as well. 20% um, of all Boston Public School students, and that's over 10,000 of them, have not been either in school or online in school since March. And the coronavirus pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color in very intense and sincere ways. And as a community and as nonprofits who are on the ground, like the four that you'll see here today, um, who are working to navigate these turbulent times, many of our leaders are working on issues that are quite similar to what they've been working on for the long haul. And so the disparities that I think we're all talking about um, have been challenges that many nonprofits are working on day in and day out. And so the, the, the organizations you're gonna meet today really need support. They need support from funders who can respond with emergency funds, flexible grants, loosened reporting restrictions, and sometimes a listening ear. They need support from skilled volunteers who can provide critical knowledge and training and can step in and help out. And they need support from peer networks, much like you're seeing today. The, the eight organizations you're seeing for today, and there'll be four next week, they have a network. They have other people to talk to. They have reasons for coming together for shared learning and support, particularly through difficult times. And because of this, we know that SIF is more important now than ever. So the way that we can have you help us is you're gonna meet four organizations today who've been doing and continuing to do really important work in very, in very sincere ways that build the fabric of the community. They're here today to meet new people, to share their messages, and to ask for your help and connections. We'll be supporting them actively for two years, but what we call our forever portfolio, they stay with us for life. We'll be sending around their prospectuses tomorrow and sharing their videos and creating other opportunities for people to get to know them and get to know their work. But what we need from you is a little bit of partnership to step in and work on connecting with our connection cards. Um, tell them somebody you know. Tell them how you might be able to help. Jump in with money or connections to others. We truly appreciate your help. Thank you. And now we're gonna move into the presentations. And I'd like to bring Tanya Inwald forward, but before she begins, I'd like to thank the full SIF team and the board of directors for help day in and day out and for their ability to pivot and shift as the world has rapidly changed. Um, Tanya, please step in and we look forward to hearing from all of the innovators. Thank you. Great. Susan, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited for today. As you all know, today is a very important day for our innovators because it's a culmination of almost a year of really hard work on their part. It all started last June when they applied to be considered for the SIF Accelerator, along with over 130 other interested nonprofit organizations. And they went through two rounds of written applications, intense evaluation and interview sessions with track partners and evaluation experts. We did site visits with our innovators and spent a lot of time on due diligence. And then after six months of this very thorough vetting, we selected our wonderful cohort of eight innovators to receive access to capacity building resources valued at over $150,000 each. 
And these services include consulting, executive coaches, access to our in-kind partners, exposure to potential funders, and many more. And this year is particularly unique as we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And as you know, we had to pivot and shift our work quite a bit. And we're so grateful for our 2000, um, 2020 innovators for sticking with us and trusting our process and working really hard to be able to share their stories with all of you today. So thank you. And today is actually not the end of their journey with SIF. They'll continue working with us for the next 18 months. And then uh, the innovators will join our alumni network so that we can continue supporting them and building their capacity, expanding their networks and providing access to new resources. So I'm excited to get started and I would like to introduce our first innovator, Elevated Thought, a pack titled Advancing Arts Engagement, sponsored by the Jacket Foundation. Marquise Victor is the founding executive director of Elevated Thought. He leads Elevated Thought's vision, objectives, goals, and mission and manages their contracts, commissions, and partnerships. In addition to being a poet and artist, Marquise has a master's degree in education from Leslie University and compiled over, se over seven years of public school experience before focusing on elevated thought full time. A husband and father, he's currently pursuing a doctor of education at Northeastern University. Marquise, welcome. Thank you, Tanya. Let me share my screen with you good people. All right. So why do kids create? When I was eight years old, creativity was a way for me to grapple with the feelings of being biracial. It was a safe haven for me and my growing curiosity. As seen here in one of my renowned third grade creations, the boy who traveled many places. But by the end of my sophomore year in high school, I had shunned my creative practices and drowned my desire for learning. Five months into my freshman year of college after receiving a basketball scholarship, I was kicked out of school and out of my home. I moved into this house on the second floor in Providence with a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a family member. My destructive behavior increased and became more dangerous. My repressed creativity stunted my development as a conscious human being. Then one night in my near empty room, I picked up a used notebook and allowed my creativity to reemerge. For the first time in my life, I was asking those big existential questions through poetry. Who am I? What am I doing here? What's the point of it all? This is where the elevated thought process began. Fast forward to March of 2008 in the rented out construction warehouse. Alex J. Bryan, my longtime right hand man and street artist was working on a mural. I was writing a spoken word piece to go along with it. On one side of the mural was a saxophonist. Music notes flowed in and out of a loose depiction of Lawrence. The city was dark, gritty, and ominous, but there were glimmers of hope. On the other side of the mural was a young woman crying. Her tears formed the words, why? Why is there so much sorrow in the city? We wondered aloud how we could address social issues. Encouraging art as liberation would be our contribution. I lifted my head up and said, hey, this is elevated thought right here. And the idea and the name stuck. We officially launched Elevated Thought in 2010 as an art and social justice organization, actively serving and assisting communities through creative youth development, beautification projects, youth organizing, and public outreach. ET helps youth and communities to understand art's liberating power and how to use arts to make their voices heard. We are based in Lawrence, a city built on the back of immigrants with the history of putting voice and action into fighting for fairness and justice from the 1912 Bread and Roses strike to today. Now Lawrence is a city that has had an unfair share of social inequities and disparities. With poverty rates two times the state average, this has led to youth homelessness, food insecurity, and high school dropout rates three times the state average. Though Lawrence as a whole is strengthening, you still have limited access to art, creativity, or imagination to help them, and help them develop greater realities for themselves in their city. 
The arts also make clear economic sense. According to the arts in America, for every $1 invested in the arts, there was a $9 return on investment through a decrease in both welfare roles and crime and disciplinary infractions, an increase in wages among youth involved in the arts, marked increases in SAT scores, and impacts on students' academic, social, and emotional outcomes as we've seen firsthand at ET. The work of all Elevated Thoughts programming starts with convening meaningful conversations with our primarily Latinx youth between the ages of 13 and 22 in our space in Lawrence. These conversations in that safe space encourage young people to explore ideas, social, political, and economic concepts in various art mediums. With this trust, our students' creativity emerges and shines, be it through murals, spoken word, visual arts or video production. Collaborations with city officials, business leaders, school systems, for-profit and non-profit organizations then spill out into the broader community. Together, these support ET's pillars of empathy, acceptance, engagement, and opportunity to enhance building a civil society. Through our core program called I Am Art, I Am Change, we dig into empathy. We serve 450 youth each year, providing young people an opportunity to build a foundation of self while addressing social issues through their creations. Our beautification projects build acceptance and public awareness about the importance of art and create a dynamic and positive art culture in the city of Lawrence. We encourage engagement through our community workshops, bringing together a cross section of Lawrence to authentically engage through the arts. Together, these add up to increased opportunity for our youth through paid work on commissions, apprenticeships, and scholarships. Our young people earn a paycheck while making an impact in their community. And that's how we've been making a difference. We have 100% graduation rate among our program participants. We have employed over 30 Lawrence youth over the past two years. We've distributed over $200,000 in paychecks for youth in that same time frame. We have helped eight program alums in their college pursuits by providing yearly scholarship support. Today, we have two and a half full-time employees and a tight budget, but we will serve 450 youth and 900 community members and serve thousands of others through our community partnerships with gallery openings, murals, workshops, and social media. But for every youth we work with, there are twice as many looking to walk through our door. In the next two years, we aim to double our staff and the young people and community members we serve by hiring additional full-time employees and collaborating artists to meet the needs of our growing operation. To make this happen, we're looking for a $1.2 million funding investment to give our youth the family, the voice, the tools, and the support they need to build a truly civil society leveraging art as a form of liberation. At ET, we believe youth, and in a broader sense, humans, need to access their creativity in order to understand themselves, understand how the world works, and learn to trust their voice in order to progress. I know from personal experience. At ET, we've seen that dynamic power that pours out from young people as a type of power that can change the world to embrace empathy, acceptance, and engagement. At ET, we provide that opportunity. Please join us. Together, we are arts, we are change. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marcy. I have some virtual applause that I'm sure everyone's doing in their homes. Thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation. And I do hope that all of us will have an opportunity to visit your wonderful studio in Lawrence soon and also experience your work firsthand. Um, and folks, um, I, if you have questions for, for Marquise, you know, just a quick reminder that we'll have an opportunity to uh, have a session later after the presentation. So just feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A section and we'll pass them along. Or if you just want to show your support of the innovators, feel free to use the chat function 
and uh, just make sure to direct your chat, chat to all panelists and attendees. And Marquise, thanks so much. Thanks for starting us off today. And um, now I would like to uh, introduce our second innovator. And I know all the wonderful comments are coming in. So, so folks are really excited for Marquise and excited to hear the next presentation. So, oh, I have Terry um, wearing a nice hard hat. That was a surprise. Um, our next innovator is Whale, the Waterfront Historic Area League on a track that's titled Revitalizing New Bedford through community-based efforts supported by the Shroff Charitable Trust. Terry Bernard is the executive director of Whale. She has over 25 years experience in community and economic development and nonprofit management, concentrating in real estate development. Terry holds a master's in urban planning from George Washington University and is also an adjunct professor teaching adaptive reuse real estate feasibility at Roger Williams University. Terry, we're excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you to SIF. Uh, Helena Hartnett and to Shath Charitable Trust for all your support over these virtual months together. The Waterfront Historic Area League, known as Whale, is the only historic restoration nonprofit in the country that is also a community development corporation. We undertake complex restoration projects that revitalize the New Bedford community. New Bedford once a leading whaling port is where the tale of Melville's Moby Dick begins. It is still a maritime city with buildings that tell the story of the past, like the Siemens Bethel and Mariner's home pictured here and recently restored by Whale. Whale was founded in reaction to urban renewal in the 1960s, when historic neighborhoods were cleared for new highways. Whale saved buildings that were supposed to be demolished and renovated and repurposed them. These pro properties remain a part of the heart and soul of the city and speak to the lives of the immigrants who built them. Today, New Bedford is a diverse gateway city with 43% of the population of Cape Verdean and Portuguese descent, as well as a growing Latino population. Neighborhoods suffer from disinvestment, resulting in dilapidated buildings and a loss of community pride. Wales community development approach begins with identifying vacant historic buildings in danger of demolition, especially in underinvested neighborhoods. To determine the best reuse of the building, we engage the community, neighbors, businesses, city planners, and nonprofits. Next, we work with the restoration team, including architects and engineers, to design the reuse of the buildings. In every project, Whale incorporates green building practices. We are also undertake financial feasibility and cre create a su sustainable business plan for each project. Then we enlist investors. Whale has the expertise to gather a wide variety of resources for projects, including local, state, and federal grants, tax credits, and private philanthropy. With the funding secured, we begin the restoration work with a team consisting of staff, architects, construction crew, and volunteers to return the building to its original integrity with new community purpose. The result is a building transformed with a whole new life and a new story to tell, leading to a revitalized neighborhood with instilled community pride. Over the past five years, Whale has leveraged $15 million in funds to complete 11 restoration projects. In the process, we've created jobs, and economic opportunities. Here is some of our work. We restored a whaling merchant's mansion to create seven units of affordable housing. An 1830 Cape Verdean's whaleman's home was restored to serve 20 veterans for transitional housing. The newly opened project is currently housing veterans infected with COVID-19, a sign of the times. 
the director of the veterans program said, without the leadership of Whale, this building would have been lost and now is providing a great service to the veteran community. Currently, Whale is working with the Cape Verdean Association to convert a former vaudeville theater into a cultural center. The adjacent weed infested lot you see in the picture will become a park with a mural celebrating the island immigrant community. This will create a transformative gateway to the district known as the International Marketplace. Also in the International Marketplace, we are working with a nonprofit partner on the restoration of a film theater to be a mixed use economic center. We are under construction on the restoration of the 1829 First Baptist Church, once a famous meeting house that was the birthplace of Robert's Rules of Order. It will have a whole new life as a community theater. We are partnering with a nonprofit to restore foreclosure for a downtown LGBTQ community center, the only such center in the entire South Coast. And finally, we are restoring a historic firehouse for eight affordable apartments. Our goal over the next two years is to grow our capacity to undertake restoration projects like these that'll revitalize low-income neighborhoods. To do so, we must increase our small staff of four by adding a project manager and a community outreach coordinator. And we must grow our capital fund from 350,000 to 750,000. We are looking for an investment of 850,000 over the next two years to help us grow our capacity to do our work. With your help, Whale and its partners will continue to propel New Bedford and all its great diversity into a future that can rival its celebrated past and its old buildings will continue to speak to new generations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Great job. What a range of such different but equally impactful projects. Again, I hope that the chance to visit New Bedford soon. It's particularly beautiful in the summer, but um, we at SIF actually have been brainstorming ways in which we can continue showcasing our innovators and their work and bring it to the forefront. So stay tuned, we'll be updating you on those new strategies and, and ideas soon. Also, just a quick note that in addition to preparing for their presentations, our innovators also put together four page perspectives with more information about their work. And uh, we will be sending out links to the digital prospectuses and the follow up email. And for those of you who sign up to receive the hard copies of the perspectives, they'll be coming in in the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for them. And before I introduce our next presenter, I would like to extend a couple of thank yous to people who've been working really hard with the innovators to make sure that they get all of the support that they need. Um, and their help and support were particularly needed during these challenging times. And I'm actually so amazed uh, that we were able to continue with the process and keep it very similar to the previous years, um, just besides being virtual today and, and next week, but it's been really wonderful to, to continue our work um, and pivot and shift and get the support of everybody. I would like to thank our consultants. Our wonderful consultants worked tirelessly with our innovators. They started in January and they stayed calm, they were flexible, they were patient, they were resourceful. They were just so um, amazing and helpful to our innovators during this new and challenging time. So, so thank you so much. Um, also like to thank our presentation advisors and pitch panelists. Um, everyone again was so flexible, so patient, but yet as excited as always to support our innovators and help them in any way possible. Also, our in-kind partners have been instrumental in supporting our innovators, particularly the Ariel Group and Liz Callahan, who I think is on today. She spent so many hours Zooming 
for innovators and their teams to make sure that they truly shine today. So, so thank you. And um, also, I'd like to, to thank the volunteers and our nomination and evaluation committees who helped us this wonderful cohort. And finally, acknowledge uh, the executive coaches. So many of them are actually on this presentation today. And they will be uh, working with our innovators, starting their work with them in the upcoming months. So thank you to all of the folks who've contributed. We're truly appreciative. And um, again, if you have any questions for our innovators, you know, feel free to, to type them in the Q&A section. And, and we're excited for a part of the presentation later today as well. And now I'm going to move on to our next innovator, which is 1647 on a track that's titled Own Teacher and Educator Training Opportunities for Effective and Innovative Approaches supported by the Wellington Management Foundation. Anne Walsh is a founding director at 1647, an organization that she co-founded with former Boston City Councilor John Connolly after serving as his chief of staff during his time as chair of the Education Committee. Prior to her time at City Hall, Anne spent 20 years working with various education and youth development organizations up and down the East Coast. Anne lives in Dorchester with her husband and two teenage da daughters who help her keep it real in terms of family engagement with their schools and various out of school programs. Anne, welcome. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate it. How's everyone doing in virtual world? I appreciate everyone for coming out and joining us or not coming out and joining us today. Okay, we're going to start with some quick time travel. I want you to close your eyes and think of one thing your family did to support you in your success when you were growing up. I'd love to have folks share their memories in the chat. Um, and when I get to watch this later, I'd love to read them. So I ask hundreds of educators this same question, ask them to bring up those same memories. And they tend to not mention that their families attended back to school night or went to all the PTO meetings. They remember a mom who worked two jobs and also still checked their homework. Or a grandpa who woke them up every morning to make sure they made it to school. Or a sibling who stayed up late to help them study. Most of the memories that I hear are things that happened at home and did not involve showing up at a school building on an appoint, at an appointed time. Yet that is how schools, for the most part, measure engagement with families. So what if adults at schools were be able to learn from the experts on each child, the people who know and love them best, their families? For a long time, research has told us that when families and schools work together, student outcomes are better. So making strong connections between home and school is essential in order to build an equitable education system. Now we have a global pandemic that has clarified the importance of family engagement beyond school-based events because learning has left the building. At 1647, we help educators reach out and connect with families to build those authentic partnerships that support each student. The COVID-19 pandemic has amplified 1647's mission by putting families at the center of their children's learning. This is my colleague Beliza and her first grader Maria at school in their dining room. Beliza and her husband Dan also have a seventh grader and two college students at home. Like millions of caregivers, Beliza is essentially running a one-room schoolhouse right now. Maria's teacher, Ms. Miranda, started connecting with families way back in September, so Beliza trusts her and she feels very comfortable reaching out if she has any questions or concerns as she now guides Maria's education every day. There are students, families, and educators all across Massachusetts who are trying to figure out how to do school in this new environment. And their experiences are all over the map. Now we could say Belize and Maria got lucky because they had a teacher who started building those relationships way at the beginning. But what if everybody could have a similar experience? What Maria's teacher and others know is that family engagement isn't just nice, it's also necessary. And the research backs them up. Dr. Karen Knapp at the Harvard Graduate School of Education is the nation's foremost expert on family engagement. And her research shows that students do better in school, families do better in life, and teachers are more likely to stay in the field when they work together. So that's where 1647 comes in. 1647 disrupts the status quo of family engagement in education. We're about ending those cattle call open houses or the five minute conference 
Instead, we want to focus on building authentic relationships. To that end, we partner with three groups of people, educator preparation programs, K-12 schools and districts, and the out-of-school time partners who care for kids in the summer and after school. We know that educators and families want to work together, but if they haven't seen it done well, they just don't know how. Early career educators are often closer in age and experience to their students than to their students' families, and they've received little or no training in family engagement. So it often falls to the bottom of their list of competing priorities. Like Beliza, everyone on our team has either raised or is raising school-age kids. So we are able to give those educators a low-risk opportunity to test their skills with real experts before they have to call their own students' families. Our partnerships follow a three-step progression. We always start with mindset. Everyone always wants to jump to what they should do, but we need to examine our assumptions and beliefs first. Educators need to understand what their biases are and how their actions and the broader system impact equity in their schools. We start from the belief that all families have the capacity to support their children's learning. And we ask folks to get curious, not furious, in these sometimes challenging conversations. Then we move to operations. Whether by accident or by design, traditional schools aren't really set up to support high quality family engagement. Most schedules include little or no time for teachers to proactively reach out to their students' families. We dig into schools' data on their family and staff surveys to identify strengths and challenges. And our professional development workshops are full of role plays and practice on skills like making the phone call home, writing a clear and helpful text, or holding an effective com conference so teachers can build their confidence. And then we don't leave. We, we continue to offer ongoing coaching and support as schools go about changing the way they connect with families. They prototype technology, communication and translation strategies and schedule changes to ensure that all their families are valued as the experts on their children. We don't believe in one size fits all solutions. So we encourage these teams that are administrators, counselors and teachers to embrace the mantra always in beta. So they continue learning and improving together. Let's call this our status quo school. You can see the doors are closed, but people are working hard inside. They're sending home report cards and they're inviting folks to events, but that's about it. At 1647, we consider the unit of change to be the leader of the school or organization. So when that leader is ready to work on family engagement, they contact us and we take their school through the the partnership process at their own pace. This allows a school to open up and families begin to feel valued as partners. Trained educators start to reach out to families and build partnerships that are respectful, culturally, culturally responsive, collaborative, and they focus on learning, not just the student's behavior. As this is happening, families become more engaged in their child's learning at home which is critical, especially now. All of these things together bring our vision to a reality. When a leader and a team are all in for this model, it's transformative. Here are two data points from a 1647 school after just one year. You can see that staff mindsets about family capacity shifted dramatically and more families felt welcome at the school. These are the essential conditions for creating a culture of partnership. We too live by the mantra always in beta, and we don't know what will happen next, but we've already proven that we can adapt to the needs of schools and communities. In our first four years, we were philanthropically driven and learned a lot about developing and delivering content at schools and the challenges of scaling what was a pretty expensive model. In 2018, we wanted to become more financially sustainable, so we tested a fee-for-service model. We honed our content to what schools really needed and were willing to pay for. That year taught us that there was demand for this work. So we asked philanthropy to support us so that we could scale and grow the model through investments in business development. All of these pieces were coming together and the pandemic hit. The related economic fallout will make it difficult, if not impossible, for schools to afford this professional development, just as teachers are gonna need it in order to adapt to this new reality. Our plan for the next two school years is to combine philanthropy and fee-for-service funds to respond to these challenging times. We've got strong data-driven model and we're asking for your help in two ways 
to ensure all schools and organizations can access it at this critical moment. First, we need to build our network. So if you know the leader of a school, a district, an out-of-school time organization, an educator preparation program, please connect us. Second, we need money. Our mixed revenue model includes long-term philanthropic support that helps us invest in our staff and build our team without putting those costs on the backs of schools. Honestly, right now is not really the best time to rely on earned revenue, but experience has taught us that when schools have some skin in the game, they then prioritize the work. At the same time, we're committed to equity. So we don't wanna turn away any schools that are ready to do the work and just don't have the funds at the moment. So we've established a family engagement fund to create a sliding scale that ensures all communities can build strong partnerships to close some of the yawning gaps that have been made wider by this crisis. We're grateful to the Wellington Management Foundation who have, start, who have jump started this fund with a $25,000 gift, and we hope that you will join them. Homeschool partnerships are essential, but they're often neglected by a system that is spread too thin. We can no longer to afford to put off doing this work. I'm asking you to help educators rise to the occasion. This is Emilio. This is Belize's seventh grader, and he's at school at home. When Emilio and his peers think back on this time, let's make sure that they all remember that the adults at home and school were working together to support their success. Thanks very much. And thank you so much. Great presentation. And um, I think that we all agree from either our own experience or just the guessing that homeschooling children is really, really challenging. And I think the importance of family engagement is just so clear to everybody. So thank you so much for, for this wonderful work that you were doing, but also for being thoughtful and creative and pivoting and shifting to make sure that it moves forward. Um, before we move forward, I would like to just remind everybody about the connection cards that Susan, uh, Susan mentioned earlier. So if you want to connect with the innovators, fill out a connection card and we'll pass it along to them. Uh, I think the link to the connection card should be in the chat, but then also we will be including that in the follow-up email. So definitely take advantage of those if you're interested. And I would like to introduce our final presenter for today, Boston Her Higher Education Resource Center on a track called Strengthening Financial Health, Building Social Capital, and then by the Mass Mutual Foundation. I'm Acevedo, the Boston Herc's Executive Director since its founding in 1999, brings a cum laude law degree from Boston College Law School. Sam as co-chair of the Boston School of Communities Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force. And Sam also served on the 2018 BPS Superintendent Search Committee. Like most of the Boston Herc team, Sam is among the first in his family to earn a college degree. Sam, welcome. Just to be named in the same breath with Marquise and Terry and Anne is an enormous honor. Um, thank you, Mass Mutual. And thank you, uh, SIF. What does it take to alter the trajectory of a high school student's life, propelling them and their community and the generations that follow them to self-sufficiency and greatness? Nearly 20 years ago, one of the Boston Herc's best and brightest students came into my office in tears. As a first-generation student, Despite Odeline's many gifts, this world of college bewildered her, and Odeline failed out of her first semester of college. In my office that day, Odeline resolved to enroll in college, get perfect grades, and transfer to a four-year college, and then to medical school. That is exactly what she did. Today, she is Dr. Odeline Terrero on the front lines of combating a global pandemic. Shout out to you, Orlene, who is watching today. But that encounter shook me. The mission of the Boston Herd is to do right by the hundreds of Orleans in Boston public schools, beyond just enrolling in college. Our Passport to College program connects 
first generation students in the classrooms of non exam high schools with passport coaches. These are young professionals who are themselves first generation to college. The coach is a living window to a world that is tantalizingly close to her students, but that they would otherwise believe is unachievable. Even now, despite closed classrooms, these coaches continue Zooming, calling, texting, and connecting with their students, and they must. There's too much to lose. Even before this crisis, as this data demonstrates, first-generation students are more than twice as likely to drop out of college and never achieve a degree. While Black and Hispanic students are particularly at risk of dropping out of college. Nearly all passport students are first generation. Nearly all are students of color. And losing these potential young professionals has already cost the Massachusetts economy half of its growth for lack of college educated workers to fill those jobs. And ironically, the very adversity our Boston students of color face will produce the superbly courageous, resilient leaders that this nation is in dire need of if we could only provide them access to a degree in the profession. Passport was created to close opportunity and achievement gaps and unlock the greatness within our first generation BPS students of color, outperforming their BPS peers. 83% of our passport seniors are going on to college or post-secondary education, and 81% are advancing successfully through college. Our Passport to College program connects first-generation students of color who face generational barriers to greatness with passport program coaches, who are themselves among the first in their families to complete college in the classrooms of BPS non-exam high schools for an average of 15 hours per week. The passport coach imbue these, imbues these youth with the 21st century skills, habits of the mind typically not available in first generation homes or taught in high school classrooms, but are essential to success in college and in the 21st century workplace. Coaches connect students daily to resources, internships, and other ambassadors to success. And Passport creates a cascading effect. First-generation coaches lead first-generation students to transformation who in turn transform their communities. These are Passport coaches like Nesha Gonzalez and Passport students like Javier Suarez. When they met in, an, in a BPS classroom, college was not on Javier's radar. In fact, Javier resisted the idea and told Nesha as much. No one in his family had ever completed a college degree. What if he tried and failed? But Nesha saw something in Javier that he could not yet see. And over their two years together, she was tenacious, not letting him quit, not letting him fail. Javier applied to 12 colleges and was accepted to every one of them. Javier graduates this spring from Regis College with honors, having served as president of Regis's Latino American student organization. Our goal is simple. We want to connect more first-generation Boston students with more first-generation passport coaches, who in turn will connect them to a universe of social capital and a path to greatness. Boston Herc seeks an investment of $700,000 over the next two years to increase the number of Boston high school students being served by the passport program, nearly doubling from 950 to nearly 1,900 students and alumni, increase the number of BPS high school partnerships by 33% from our current nine to 12 BPS high schools, and serve more students, including freshmen and sophomore, 
in both our current schools and in the schools to come. You can help us add coaches, add services to alumni, and deepen our infrastructure to serve them, expanding the Passport program in its depth and breadth and capacity. It's our ambition to see a passport coach in every non-exam BPS high school. But that has always been but a means to an end. The end we long for is to see more Odalines and Javier's thriving, achieving, and fulfilling their call to greatness. At our core, we believe their destination is greatness, and the Boston Herc will not rest until we achieve it. I don't, I don't have Tanya's clapping machine, so I'm going to be the clapper myself. <laughs> So to, to all of the innovators, I think Sam's so heartfelt. I think we're with you with all of your students at this hard time. Um, Terry, all the work you're doing in New Bedford and restoring buildings. And I think everybody acknowledged how much the importance of building those connections between students, pa parents and teachers are right now. And Marquise, I think your artwork is driving us all up to Lawrence to actually be on your team. So thank you so much and you know, heartfelt bravo and appreciation for everyone for our first showcase. I think this looks like we've been doing it for years and years and years. Um, now we'd like you to take a minute or two, fill out your virtual connection cards. I believe that there's a link in the chat box or a few links in the chat box. We'd also love some of you to jump on. We know that there's some quiet Q&A, so there's additional Q&A that we've been getting um, in the box, but getting some Q&A in other ways. We also want to remind people that the second showcase will be coming up next Wednesday, June 3rd, with another four amazing organizations great slides, great speakers, and most of all, people doing really great and important work um, around social change in this community. And we'd love you to know them and to see their work. So come, tell people you know about it, um, pass the information off. Um, as we mentioned, you will be getting some follow-up information on these four innovators tomorrow. Again, the more you can pass the information on, share, connect, bring it together. We truly, truly appreciate it. So we're going to move into the question and answer segment of our event today. Um, we hope many of you will be able to stay with us and hear from the four innovators. I'd like to bring on Carolyn Shaughnessy, who is the Director of Network Engagement at the Social Innovation Forum, who's going to field the questions and kind of help moderate um, the conversation. And we'll see you all um, at right before 3.30 to close out. So thank you again. Hi, everyone. Let's see. We there yet? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Congratulations to our social innovators. Amazing job. Um, one of the great things about um, today's session being online is that we actually have some time for Q&A. So I'm going to jump in with some questions for our innovators, but you all should feel comfortable to keep putting questions in the chat and we're going to get to as many as we have time for. Um, I'm going to start with Marquise. Um, Marquise, we had a question about how you're hoping to leverage the 1.2 million investment and what type of talent are you looking for in your staff? Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, so I think what comes to mind first for a lot of people when they think about staff or employees is there needs to be a great deal of our previous experience. But I think through our model, because our young people in, you know, in high school are jumping on to commissions, they're leading workshops, uh, they're leading advocacy campaigns. Um, I think they're building themselves up in their experience where they can have more responsibility. So what we've been seeing a lot over the, the past couple of years of Elevated Thought and the past year in particular is that a lot of young people in Lawrence, um, you know, older high school young people are having more responsibilities with Elevated Thought 
So their pay increases and their hours increase. But we're also seeing a lot of young people that are going to community college. Uh, Northern Essex Community College is in the city. Um, it's a great place and, and, and you know, it's been growing and supporting a lot of the young people who are alumni of Elevated Thought. So you have college age young people that have more flexibility to take on more responsibilities while they're working with, um, you know, our art director or program director. So I'm the only full-time employee right now. Uh, we have two and a half full-time employee equivalent, but we're hiring our second full-time employee uh, program director uh, next week, actually. She's going to start full-time. She just graduated college, um, and she was our first ever youth leader. So we have that type of experience within the city um, that's going to support some of the other young people that are growing up in the, in the program. So they get that experience, they get that opportunity, and can contribute from a staff level with ET. Great. Thank you, Marquise. Appreciate that. Um, my next question is for Terry at Whale. Terry, how does Whale choose buildings to restore and how do you decide what its new purpose will be? There's always uh, a lot of buildings to choose from. Over 80% of the ha uh, building stock in New Bedford is historic. Um, and in the in a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of these beautiful historic buildings are vacant and dilapidated. So um, my board of directors and I and my staff, we have a evaluation sheet um, that we use to look at projects. Um, as you can see from the presentation, a lot of um, the buildings we're currently tackling right now are a result of foreclosures. Um, so residential foreclosures and then um, buildings that have fallen out of use because their uses are no longer relevant in today's world like churches, firehouses, um, and school buildings. So the challenge there is to think creatively with the community and engage the community to find a, a new use that will revitalize the neighborhood. And a lot of times um, that process is a lot more challenging than to actually restore the building and do the construction. Um, because you, it, you, know, you, you need to find a mix of uses that's really going to make an impact and help of the low income residents of the city. Thank you, Terry. It was amazing to see those photos in your slides. Um, I'm going to move on to Anne at 1647. Um, Anne, um, let's see. Um, can you say more about the connections to higher ed that you referenced in the help slide? Yes. And thanks to Marvin who put that question in there. Well done. So, <laughs> We would really prefer if our teachers arrived into schools already understanding family engagement as a critical part of their work, right? We're do, we will work in schools and we will help folks figure out and change their practice, but wouldn't it be great if it was just part of their preparation? Um, so what we'd like is to be able to connect more with traditional higher education schools of education that are preparing our teachers and make sure that they are getting the types of training that we provide. The other type of prep program or higher ed program is school leader programs, right? So we really do believe the unit of change is the school leader. So a teacher um, who goes through workshops with us and then brings it to their school can create pressure on a school leader that might encourage them to come talk with us. But if we can get to a room of 10, 20, 30 folks who are preparing to be school leaders and work with them on designing schools with family engagement at the center, then when they go and start leading schools, that's just part of how they go about their work. So the places where folks are being prepared to lead schools or lead classrooms are the spaces where we think we can have the highest impact. That makes great sense, Anne, thanks. Um, Sam, I'm from Boston Herc. Sam, why is it so important to have a coach in school and how is this different than other programs in the Boston Public Schools? That's a, that's a terrific question. Um, I also noticed that that question originated by our friend, uh, our friend Kim Komar. Uh, and Kim, uh, wonderful to have had you in our corner uh, and in so many ways and to have you here today. Um, 
that phrase that a coach is a living window uh, to, um, to a different world, a world that's obtainable, but to the students in her classroom, but would seemingly inaccessible. That's not just poetry. Um, and, uh, and Marquise could correct me there. <laughs> you know, Sam, that's not poetry. Um, it is, it's, so first of all, what, what is a coach not? Coaches are not teachers. Passport coaches are not certified uh, teachers. And we are aware of that. Uh, and every coach that steps into a classroom steps on hollowed ground, and we know it. And we're, nor are they certified counselors. So what are they? A coach is like this little person sitting in the desk in front of them, only four or so years down the road, who happened to have walked down the, the same path this child is on, except has succeeded, has learned something, has gone down the road a little further, and can come back and report back, in a sense, to their younger selves. This is how you can make it too. And that's the primary function of a coach. They are there with a specific purpose of imbuing these, these young people with hope and with a vision for their own personal greatness. My wife is a teacher. She has five or six jobs. <laughs> Coaches have one job and it's imbuing hope in the students that they serve. I appreciate that, Sam. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Marquise for a minute. Um, Marquise, um, let's see. Um, let's see. You shared your personal trajectory from being troubled as a teen to moving yourself to a creative and productive way of being. Does Elevated Thought serve students to make this transition? And how, and how do you do that exactly? How does the program do that? I mean, I think for us, it's, it's going really back to the basics is allowing young people a place to explore themselves in the world around them and be in a space where other people are on that, on that similar uh, tram line, if you will. Um, when you can go in a space, as we've seen with ET, and you feel comfortable enough to ask difficult questions about yourself, as I had to do, um, and then subsequently ask difficult questions about the world around you, then it opens up your perception um, and allows you to grapple with certain realities in a way that you haven't previously done before. And I was able to do that when I was, you know, 19 years old. But when young people are able to do that in our space at, you know, 14, 15 years old, it doesn't kind of make them jaded and bitter like a lot of our adults are, you know, about the world. But it just kind of prepares them uh, for those realities and allows them con to consider it. You know, we're talking about marginalization, we're talking about oppression, we're talking about all these social inequities. So if they can understand the cha challenges that are stacked up against them while they're building that confidence to feel, feel like they can do that. And they're, they're, in a, they're a collective where they're not alone in that process. Then, you know, that's all we can hope for. We're not, you know, the, it was really pretty and there's all, a lot of dope artwork that it was, vast majority was done by our young people. But it's not about, the end results, it's about the process. And if young people go in there and they're just brainstorming and they're write, writing little haikus or they're just doing little doodling, but they're feeling more comfortable about themselves and feel more confident to address all those issues that they see around them and wanna find a way to you know, do their part to change it, then that's, that's all we're looking for. Great, thank you, Marquise. Terry, question for about whale. Um, once a renovation is completed, what role does whale play? Uh, that's a mixed question, and it's an important one because the, these projects um, have to be viable and sustainable after the restoration is complete. A lot of times we work with um, <clears throat> local nonprofits, especially in the arts and cultural economic de uh, development um, arenas. Um, so we've created 
a mixed use art center with uh, with local nonprofits who um, use the building afterwards. Um, and that's where the business plan comes in um, because you're actually creating an operating budget and business plan for these organizations. We're working with a former innovator, Community Economic Development Center um, in partnership. And it's, it's just a great partnership um, between our two community development corporations to restore a, uh, a historic film theater for an economic uh, center for CEDC and for local businesses. Um, there'll be a business um, startup textile um, worker space. Um, it's, it's just a super innovative program. And the list goes on. We're working with a local theater company to restore a historic church. And so they will be managing that church, owning and managing that church afterwards. We do retain some buildings and manage them to ourselves, and then we do pass them on um, to the private. So it's a, it's a mix, but uh, you know, you get very attached to these projects and finding mm -hmm. that end use that's going to sustain itself in the community and add to the the revitalization of new bedford um, is really important thanks terry I've, I've been amazed hearing about the diversity of projects that whale is involved in amazing um and um so i have a, a question that feels very relevant um to, to what's going on today so our teachers are already overburdened with class preparation documentation and paperwork teaching meetings and more how do you believe it will be possible for them on top of all that that they're already doing to build and maintain meaningful relationships with up to 150 families? High school teachers can have that many students. Yes, that is the $64,000 question. Uh, <laughs> work extraordinarily hard. And one of the things that we talk with educators and school leaders about is that you can't just layer this on top and tell people to do one more thing but that we need family engagement to actually become embedded in everything that that teachers are already doing as part of their practice um but the the high school the middle and high school thing is one of these like chicken and egg situations right people say oh well the parents stop being engaged when the kids hit middle school and parents say, well, I don't even know who to call. I remember when my own kid moved from elementary school to middle school and I needed to ask a question, like a really sort of straightforward, how does this work question. And I said to her, well, who do I call? Like, is your homeroom teacher like a person who matters in your life? Like you spend 12 minutes a day with your homeroom teacher or is your guidance counselor someone that you know? And she's like, I've never even met my guidance counselor. So like, who's my person is the question for families, right? And what I think actually when we work with middle and high school, it's to shift that mindset that educators don't actually have to be the person for all 150 of their students, but families all need a person at their kid's school who is their kid's person. So that's where your operational work comes in, is shifting operations around and, and cohorting kids into smaller groups that a teacher says, I'm the advisor for these 12 kids. And we don't just ask teachers. We say every counselor should have an advisory. You know, the, the PE teacher, the specialists, the anybody in that building should have an advisory of 12 to 20 kids. And they're the contact person for those kids. And they meet those kids once a week at least. And so they know them and they're the contact for the families. And so that you can really connect and they can then have the conversations with those teachers if the family has a concern or vice versa, right? So they act as like a conduit in those higher ed spaces. Um, because families, like I have two kids, eighth grader and an 11th grader, and I have 30 adults in their lives that I'm supposed to maintain relationships with, right? Between their teachers, their coaches, their out of school time folks, their therapists for their different IEP needs, whatever. So in both directions, it doesn't work for everyone to have a high quality, deep, authentic relationship. That's just unreasonable. But operationally, schools can really break that up to make it a more reasonable approach and simplify it both for the educators and for the families. That makes good sense, Anne. Thank you. Sam, um, what is the number one factor that would allow HERC to go to the next level? How would additional funding help in this respect? 
Ah. The million dollar question, Sam. Yeah, yeah. And I saw that it was submitted by our board chair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the number one unit of change for the Boston Higher Education Resource Center is the passport coach. In a way, the most beautiful thing about us is also the most challenging thing about us. Um, I discovered years ago that my, you know, uh, if I, if I, if I did a deal in a way with in the dark side, I could be, I could make my job a lot easier by a different way of working. But the Boston Herc is a boutique. Factories are much more efficient, but it's a boutique. And the only way we know how to do coaching is this high touch, you know, extremely personal connection between first generation young, first generation young people and first generation coaches. So we need more of them. At the moment, the Boston Herc, someone you know, um, calculated uh, a central office member who, uh, someone from central office who happens to serve on our board says, Sam, we're only serving maybe 10% at the moment of the, of the class of students, the types of students that we could be serving at DPS. To close to that other 90%, we need more people. But it's not just a matter of opening the tap even if you opened up the purse strings, which I hope you do, and <laughs> we hired a whole bunch of coaches, that's not enough. We also need folks to uh, incorporate those coaches into the Boston Herc way of doing this. That means supervision. That means adding a whole other layer of what we call senior program coaches. We have a few of these. They're, so they're, they're like drill instructors. They're the drill sergeants who our coaches themselves have been, and we've, you know, uh, 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 we have two, you know, senior program coaches at the moment. We would need, we calculated that we would need one senior program coach for every four new coaches that we hire, simply to com com uh, keep that cohesion. And then what are we gonna do as a team? Well, the great unknown, the great sort of frontier for us is deepening our work with those students who go on to college, our alumni. And a good $160,000 of the, that $700,000 ask is dedicated to basically virtually create a, an autonomous program, just focusing on the, uh, on the um, 13 to 16 space. You know, gradually making sure our kids make it all the way through college. That translates to money. That's where the money would be invested. I think the best investment is to uh, replicate. By the way, we already know who that the, who would be the director of that um, alumni initiative. It's Nation Gonzalez, the young lady that we portrayed here in this in our presentation. Uh, but she's going to need a team, and that's going to take money. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm going to um, ask our final question, the same one actually to all of you that just came up in our chat from a past innovator. Thanks, Sarah, from Veterans Legal Services. Um, Sarah asked, how has the SIF process been transformative for each of you? Mm. Um, or what has been the biggest challenge you've had to confront so far during this process? And I'll start with Marquise. I'll stick with the same order. Sure. It's a great question. Uh, two things come to mind for me. Uh, one is that this whole process forced me to slow down and to not worrying about, you know, where I need to go day to day to make sure a program is situated, uh, that commissions are going smoothly, like, you know, trying to, trying to build relationships. It, it, it forced me to slow down, to breathe, and to reevaluate where we are and where we want to go as an organization. And then connected with that, the second thing is how do I articulate where we wanna go, where we're at right now, and where we wanna go in a way that's more accessible. So I have a bad habit of using a lot of adjectives and, and phrases that might um, you know, turn people away, like critical consciousness, 
to my Palo Frere people out there. Um, you know, so kind of condensing my language in a way where I can share my passion and what I believe the purpose of ET is and what we can do as an organization if, if given even more support, um, you know, in a way that it can be shared with, with more people. But I'm just grateful, you know, I had a fantastic consultant, Wendy Stork Grossman, who was just by my side this, this whole time. And, you know, the entire process was just really reinvigorating for me to just breathe, like I said, and to have a bit more clarity with where I want Elevated Thoughts to go. So thank you, SIF. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everybody else. Thank you, Marquise, and agree about Wendy. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to Terry. Um, now I've lost the question. Uh, Terry. Um, how has the SIF process been transformative for you? Um, <clears throat> it's been really transformative. Um, and uh, it's, it's helped. And I would, I would um, agree that it's very, makes you take a look at yourself and, and slow down and, and, and really examine your organization and your mission. Um, and the uniqueness of Whale as a community development corporation, uh, we really wanted to tell our story that um, historic preservation or restoration is not one dimensional bricks and mortar and that's it. It, it, it involves the entire community, it involves many partners, um, and it involves really examining the city itself and determining what's gonna enrich the lives of the people in the city and those even visiting it. Um, and, I, and with the help of Helena and SIF and my wonderful staff, we really um, took a heart, and, and all the consultants that have helped with the graphics and everything else, uh, and you, Carolyn, uh, um, to, to tell that story through words, through uh, graphics, through emotion, um, and through real self-examination um, of the organization and the people in it. Um, so that, that's that been really special. It's been unique doing it during COVID. Um, because it's a very, as the innovators know, this is a very personal process. And it was so nice to actually be with all the innovators in the same room at the beginning of the process. And then to, to see you all on the screen is not quite the same, but I must say SIF has done just an outstanding job of uh, pivoting, as Tanya said, it, and moving into this virtual world and still keeping some of that emotion in the work that, that we've all been doing these past months. So thank you. Thanks, Terry. And there were two questions here. Well, the other one was, what has been the biggest challenge you've had to confront so far during this process? And you can't say it was your screen share. Right. Yeah. I, right? That yeah. can't be. Because you did beautifully. There would have been no challenges, Carolyn. It's been very <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, of course, the like slowing down and the reflective practice and not doing my other work all the time has been a little bit tricky because uh, I'd rather than have to do these hard things that SIF asks us to do, but I appreciate being asked to do them. Um, I think the thing that has been sort of eye-opening for us as a team um, is trying to explain what we do to folks who aren't in education or maybe aren't parents or are raising kids in spaces where the expectation is that families and schools collaborate because families feel more agency or more privilege or have more comfort in educational spaces, right? And so there are a lot of people through this process, and I love our, our uh, consultant Nina for like pounding us with this, like you have to be able to explain it so people get it, that for a lot of families, going into school spaces is traumatizing, right? And so how, because the system 
has not been set up to welcome them or to make them feel honored and valued. And for a lot of teachers, uh, reaching out to those families has been traumatizing because if they haven't had good training and support, then like multi-generational anger in those families has just been landed on the teacher who did the nice thing and tried, you know, and they just received whatever pain the family has. And so trying to figure out how to communicate that to folks who haven't been on either side of that table has been a really interesting um, process for us to, to, because when we work with the most of the schools and organizations and spaces that we work in, folks are acutely aware of that reality for themselves as staff or for their students and families um, who are traditionally been marginalized in these spaces. So trying to make that more universal and explain to more people that like not everyone feels comfortable walking in or calling the teacher or sending that email with their concern because there may be a language barrier, a cultural barrier, a history of negative experiences, whatever it is, and that this is can be very tricky for both folks in the partnership. Um, I hope that we've gotten to a place now where we communicate that more effectively um, because folks in the space already are like, yeah, yeah, we get it. So now like, let's talk about fixing it and changing it. But it's, it's a great opportunity to sort of open other folks' eyes to the challenge. And you just communicated it beautifully here and you communicated it beautifully in your presentation. So thank you. Um, Sam, we have about two minutes. Um, for you to close us out with with your answer to one of those questions, how does how has the SIF process been transformative, or what has been the biggest challenge you've had to confront so far during this process? I think the biggest challenge we've confronted is the one that the planet has confronted, uh, and along with SIF. Um, uh, to quote, to to steal from Anne, we were in beta, all of us. That's the, right. The world was in beta since the beginning. There are many things, perhaps, you know, it, this, I, this forced us all, you know, it's a, a little bit like the, the Apollo 13 movie. SIF itself has had to scrap their manual on how, <laughs> how this is done and get, land us. Um, so that was a challenge. That is a challenge. This is very different from the past years. If you're a former innovator and you're listening, it, it's nothing like that. <laughs> but at the same time, um, and I, I can be a little emotional, uh, so I'm gonna try not to be very intentionally. This season may prove to be a mass extinction for many nonprofits and many nonprofit leaders of the metro. And I found myself on many occasions thanking God that of all the years that we could have possibly have been an SIF innovator, it happened to be the year where Susan and her team was out there rooting for us. It's someone other than me out there trying, you know, struggling for, you know, survival. I didn't have to do this alone. Um, just close with this, you know, um, Liz, our aerial group uh, consultant, our actress consultant, to make us more, you know, more and better. Um, the 12, you know, the eight of us were there in this room for a day, just becoming actors. And it created a bond. It was a la one of the last times we were actually physically together ever. Fast forward, maybe um, two months later, one of our first innovator meetings post COVID. There was just this connection with us. That's just really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. That is a, mm -hmm. that is a great way to, to, to close us out. And, and, um, and we very much appreciate it. And we loved being in beta with all of you. So I'm um, hand it back to Susan. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to jump back in for just a closing thought and, and appreciate all that you're saying and feeling about SIF. 
what I wish is I wish I could hug all of you. <laughs> we're, we're used to both being in a room together where we can do that. But I think I often say that the SAF process is one where we really hug our innovators tightly. And it's, it's both physically and literally. I think that you all talked about the support from the consultants, from the designers, from the coaches who you haven't even met yet, from your presentation advisors, from funders who are getting to know you better and better. And I think that we try to create this community where you're held. And I think Sam said it effectively in a, in a time where I think we all need to be held. Um, that you can be a partner with us and we can be a partner with you and we can feel in community at a time that many of us are struggling to wonder what is community and how do we find it because it's not the same community that we knew three months ago. And so we truly appreciate um, your being with us and our being with you. And um, those of you who are online with us, we appreciate your joining. And we hope that you will um, take time to figure out how you can help these four groups, um, fill out the connection cards, we hope you'll come back next Wednesday, June 3rd, to meet the other four organizations. And please tell others. This is first time online, first time. It's free. So please join us. And um, congrats to the SAF team, who really did an amazing job. And this is our first virtual event. And um, the, the way that it came off has been unbelievable. And I think that um, all of the presenters were so ready to be with all of you. And so thank you. Again again for joining us and please come back on June 3rd and stay with us as an organization and, and get behind our innovators. They, they need your support. Thank you.